is be aggressive, be a bitch. You set out to achieve something and you you have to achieve it because you don't quit. You, you don't milk half a herd of cows or plow half a field or turn half a field of hay and go, okay, well, it's three o'clock then, I'm done. Each culture is different. Every company has a slightly different culture. And I felt like I had to mask certain parts of myself. I, I've been told many times during my career that, oh, you're too much. You're too much, really. Dress sense, not as edgy as I would have liked it to be. Putting my, my opinions forward, I learned to taper that back, to be what they wanted me to be. Beat the crap out of suppliers, but that never worked for me. It never sat with me. I could see the model of leadership that assured success, and my boss expected me to be beating this guy hard. That's not my style. It's not about how tough am I and how hard can I beat you down. That doesn't get you anywhere. You might win some small little battle, but you're not going to win the war. And so I would do things like this. Jan, authentic leadership is on the rise with its focus on employee engagement, human potential and organizational transparency. Authentic leadership will transform the workplace as we know it. What did you mean by that? Oh, well, Harry, you may not know this, but the automotive industry has been and continues to be in some cases all about command and control. Mm. When you look up command and control, you see the automotive industry, all the, uh, all the logos of all of our favorite OEMs come up because that's the way that we rolled in this industry. And it was very much about, I am the boss. I am in charge. This is my department. This is my silo. I will tell you what to do. Uh, maybe there'll be a little bit of discussion in there about, yeah, you can, yeah, l let me hear what you think. Maybe there was a little bit of that. But at the end of the day, the boss called the shots. It was about hierarchy. Mm. And we all learned how to emulate those kinds of behaviors. A lot of micromanagement going on. A lot of uh, tough guy. You know, the more aggressive you could be in the industry, the the further further up the ladder you went. And I learned yeah. how to emulate that. That will not play anymore if we are to take this industry into the future. We you cannot transform the product and trans and win in the marketplace without also winning in the workplace. And I quote Stephen M. R. Covey, the leadership guru of all time. And he is dead right. So authentic leadership, Harry, is about being yourself. Imagine that, going to work, not trying to fit a mold of what you think a leader or a boss should be, just being yourself, showing some vulnerability, caring for your people, providing an environment for them to thrive. That's the leadership model and the culture transformation that we need in this industry. Kind of a long-winded hmm. answer though, wasn't it? <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, it's nice to articulate what you mean because some people go, oh, you're talking about leadership and just say, you can go straight to that command and control model. That is, I tell you what to do, and you do it. So then I guess that's what most people would think. That's what I think anyway, from, from working. And we'll get on to that, and we'll get on to what you're doing. But I, there is a question I like to start off the podcast with, and that is, what ignited your passion for cars in the first place? Good question. So I was in Wales, as you know. I was born in Wales, and I started my career with Borg Warner Automotive. And Borg Warner at the time made transmissions for Saab and Jaguar. And I didn't know anything about automotive. I didn't even, I wasn't even familiar with the term. It wasn't a term that I, I knew anything about. And I was riding my horse on the field because I'm a farmer's daughter. And my mother called me in and she said, hey, this company Borg Warner wants you to interview with them. And I was at the time, I was a temp. There was a temp agency in Bridgend. And I went in and I said, oh yeah, what do, what do they do? They make batteries or something, right? That's what I thought. And uh, apparently not. They made transmission. So I walked onto the shop floor and I inhaled all the oil and coolant in the air because hs and &E wasn't so much of a thing back in the 80s. And I fell in love with the industry right there and then. And the more I got into it, I started as a purchasing assistant and then an expediter. And the more I got into it, the more it consumed me. Mm. And the rest, as they say, Harry, is history. No, I think it's right, isn't it? It's that, that solvent, I guess you could call it, <laughs> that gets into your skin. There's I don't some... know whether yeah, car enthusiasts are just drug addicts 
or it's a general connection you have? There's something about manufacturing. There's something about metal, you know, being formed and made and producing a product that moves people. There's something about all of that coming together. And to be honest, there's something about being a woman in a man's world too that excited me. Growing up as a farmer's daughter, I'm used to being around gnarly, aggressive men, right? I mean, come on, a farmer's daughter from Wales. So I, to me, it wasn't such an alien environment to be in um, back in the 80s. Very aggressive, very male-dominated. I mean, they would look to me to make the coffee because I was the woman in the room, regardless mm. of title or experience. It was like, oh, yeah, I love, I love a milk and two sugars with that then. <laughs> and I got up and did it. Imagine that happening now. Oh, my gosh. Somebody'd punch your lights out if you did that. I mean, I don't expect people to do anything for me. I guess that's that's my thing is just that, you know, you do your own thing, you get your own way, but that comes with a, with a different kind of upbringing, you know. And I'm just interested in your upbringing. You know, it might be seem quite simple. You've, I know you've, you've mentioned it quite a lot, you know, being a farmer's girl growing up in Wales. But what does that actually look like? What does that actually teach you? One of the biggest lessons I learned being a farmer's daughter is this idea of work ethic. And you mm. don't quit. You, you don't milk half a herd of cows or plow half a field or turn half a field of hay and go, okay, well, it's three o'clock then. I'm done. You know, it, it, no, it, you, you don't. You set out to achieve something and you you have to achieve it because you're depend and you're dependent on so many things that you don't control. You're dependent on the weather, right? Very much dependent on the weather. You're dependent on livestock. Mm. You know, trying to control livestock that's like trying to herd, well, I literally herd cats or herd cattle. But that's like, if that doesn't help you trying to manage manufacturing engineers on the shop floor, I, I don't know what does. So work ethic and, uh, and this ability to focus on the end goal, even though you don't control all the things around you. That's what being a farmer's daughter taught me. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I guess it's something that you don't think about from the offset, just, oh, it's just a farm, you know, but I mean, I think, have you seen, have you seen what Jeremy Clarkson has done with uh, his little thing with Amazon? No, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. Yes, yeah, so that, that really, so I guess without knowing about farming, unless you're watching Country Fire or anything like that in the UK, it's a program we have on the TV. I think that is, that is a decent example, what I think is a decent example of farming. Or, well, to me, it shows you everything because, you know, it's not, you're not just turning a field over, you're not just plowing fields because you have to, it's because they're so small. I guess such a small margin, isn't it? Like exactly. everything has to be done because you're not you're not making ends meet from field like you know from farming half a field. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. No. And to Jan, when, when when you look at sort of you know taking that into the workplace, and you said managing people and, and the machines that that move people, right? So what what moved you through the industry? What made you want to go and be at the top? Did you have a drive? You know, the work ethic is definitely there, but where did the drive come from? The drive, I think. It's one of those things you're born with, right? I've always had a drive to accomplish whatever I'm doing, as long as I am passionate about it. If I really don't have that much interest, forget it. It's not going to happen. Mm. But this idea, uh, like I'll give, I'll give you an example, right? When I was a kid growing up, I actually went to a convent school in Port Call, St. Clair's Convent, and they tried to make us, you know, perfect young ladies, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work out so well, did it? Uh, but they, you know, they try to make make you good at everything. Look, I'm not good at everything. I'm good at some things. I'm not good at art, right? I'm crap at art. So the drawings that my friends would do, you know, were uh, when you're like age 12, my drawing was the equivalent of like a five-year-old. And so I, it's not my thing. I'm, I'm never going to get into that. But when I got into this world of manufacturing and purchasing, and material control. And I became a walking bill of materials when I first started because I was the one actually typing the bill of materials into the computer system at the time. And so I, I just loved it and I wanted more of it. And and here's where I see a difference between my generation and Gen Z. And that is I couldn't care less about the mission statement of the company so much. You know, sustainability wasn't a thing back then, right? What, you know, are they really mission driven or goal driven? Um, I was more concerned about me, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I wanted I wanted a career 
I wanted more of it. I wanted money, title, power, all of it. And I wanted it as quickly as possible. And I learned how to assimilate into these different tier one companies to be what they wanted me to be, to make sure that I was successful. And until the day I walked away. Yeah. And how did, how did you learn to assimilate? Because for me, I know that what I do on a regular basis behind the scenes is I'm, I work in hospitality. I'm a waiter. And I learn how to smile and wave. And you learn how to treat people. And I find it quite draining, if I'm honest. It's very unnatural. Imagine being paid to be nice to people. Like, it doesn't really sit right. So what is it like being paid to assimilate into that culture? Each culture is different. Every company has a slightly different culture. And I felt like I was... I had to mask certain parts of myself. Mm. So I had to, I, I've been told many times during my career that, oh, you're too much. You're too much. Really? What the hell does that mean? Well, so I've learned to tone it down. So the dress sense, not as edgy as I would have liked it to be. Um, just being vocal, putting my, my opinions forward. I learned to taper that back to be what they wanted me to be because I I could see the model of leadership that assured success in the tier one space. And certainly in the late 80s and in the 90s and even into the early 2000s, it was be aggressive, be a bitch, right? I was in supply chain and purchasing, beat the crap out of suppliers, but that never worked for me. It never sat with me. And so I would do things like this. <laughs> Global negotiation contract, global contract with DuPont, one of the largest resin suppliers on the planet, right? And it was a time of allocation, and my boss expected me to be beating this guy hard. And that's not my style. So we would have our meetings outside of the conference room. So we would have them in a restaurant. We'd sit in a restaurant mm. for three hours and hammer through an agenda. Like normal, reasonable adults, it's not about how tough am I and how hard can I beat you down. That doesn't get you anywhere. You might win some small little battle, but you're not going to win the war. And you're certainly not going to transform an industry with that kind of approach. And you're not going to build supplier relationships. And so I just, I found a way to preserve who I was and my values and still operate within this model and therefore assimilate into that culture. Hmm. Yeah. So for women, for women now that, you know, are wanting to join the auto industry, and I've spoken to a few in, you know, in, in different, different parts and they've all said vaguely sort of the same thing. You know, they, they had to suppress and put some side of them. They had to, you know, act, you know, like you say, tone it down. They had to dress differently just because, it wasn't the norm. Yeah. So for you, Dinjan, like if I come to you, I'm a young young woman, coming to you go, I would like to work here, I would like to be where you are now. What are they having to do and what should they do or what shouldn't they do to get there? They should, first of all, pick the company that they want to work for very carefully. Because, Imagine yes, I, well, I would, I would, the great thing is that you've got the internet now and you've got social media, which you didn't have when I started, right? I would search everything on their social, um, if they've got a podcast, <laughs> great, but yeah. not too many of them have. But I would find out anything and everything you can and then see if you know anybody in your network that works there. Really get a sense of what that culture is because that will make or break you. If you go into a command and control culture, you'll hate it. You'll hate it. You'll wonder what the heck is going on and you'll, you'll, burn, you'll burn out and you'll leave. Or it will change you. And you don't want that to happen. So I would pay close attention to the culture. Know who you are as a human, as a leader of your own life. When I talk about leadership, it's not just leading other people. You have to learn how to lead yourself first. Make sure that those values are in line with who you are and what your interests are. That would be step one. And then don't be afraid to be yourself. I've masked so many parts to my personality over the years. I don't want anybody to feel like they have to do that. And you'll meet that leader, that boss that respects that in you and will hire you. And then that's a good match. And it's, that's what you call a gravitas, isn't it? If that's all right, that's when we talk yeah. about gravitas destroyed. Yeah. That's what you define as so, gravitas. Yeah, I've d I have taken liberty with the technical definition of the term. Gravitas obviously comes from the root word gravity. And gravity is a force. And when I use gravitas in terms of leadership, it's that force that pulls you in. 
you know, you might not know what that person does exactly or what position they are in the company, but you just know that you'll do anything for them. Hmm. That's gravitas, which is the hallmark of authentic leadership. Yeah, no, I think it's brilliant. And so what, at what point did you suddenly go, okay, now now is the time for this to change? Like you said, you, you know, mentioned you, you've done that thing, you assimilated into the culture and you had enough of it. But what was that moment that you would say went, okay, now now that's it, that's the, the pin has dropped I'm, I'm I'm out of here. That door is open for me. There's um, there's a few different perspectives on this, and I'll share mine, and then I'll share one that my my closest friend, my BFF, shared mm. with me, which I didn't realize, but she might be right. So you go through, you know, I went through decades in the auto industry in tier one uh, roles, pr- increasing responsibility, covering materials, purchasing, program management, sales, manufacturing always getting the next title, more responsibility, in some cases moving to another tier one. Hmm. And it just feels like, it's like, ah, oh, here we go again. All right, here we go again. I got to figure out this culture, right? Figure out how I play. How do I play the game? How do I win? How do I get what I need? You know, how do I move on? And when you sit in a conference room, and I'm at the highest level. I'm a chief procurement officer at the time. Three, the company revenue at the time was three billion. Global team. It's like great. I've made it. Yeah. And then you're in this conference room all day on a Monday, and it's like soul sucking. It just sucks the life out of you. And you realize you think, oh God, there's got to be more to life than this. I can't. I cannot bear to see that same PowerPoint again, month after month that's a China strategy meeting or something because it was an agenda that was passed down because this company was a carve out from General Motors many years ago. It was, and they kept the same part of the culture. So I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. And I said, all right, so you have a choice. You can just stay here and cruise into retirement easily. I had a great network, a lot of visibility in the industry, respected by my peers, my boss, could have cruised easily into retirement. Or do you get out and do something different and find a way to change this auto industry for the better? Because I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that feels that way in the auto industry. Yeah. And so I quit. Now my girlfriend says that it happened, the switch started right after I was named to the top 100 leading women in the auto industry in North America at the automotive news event. She said something happened there. It's like I reached it. It's like whatever I was striving for all my entire career, that was like the cherry on top. And she said, yeah, once you got that, you started to think differently. So I don't know. It's probably a bit of both. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like recognition that did it for you, I guess. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Let's think about being on a list. I know that when this podcast gets on those lists, you know, your ego gets a bit inflated or you get mentioned in certain places and you go, oh, that's nice. But then it goes I away, know. doesn't it? I know, don't you? Doesn't it make you feel good? Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's fantastic because someone's going, you know, that thing you've been working on, and like you say, the thing you've been working on by yourself is is worthy of someone going and putting it on some list, even though, that you know, in 10 years' times, these lists are going to be relevant. But it's nice for that moment, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. And I'm wondering what that does to you then once, once you the things you were starting thinking after that list, you know, the things that you started going, okay, now that I've on this list and I've reached these, whatever success meant to you, I guess, at that point, because this. I think it's, and it's, this probably has something to do with age as well, is you reach a point where the, the money and the title no longer became everything, mm. right? And it's like, all right, so what do you, what do you really want to do? And there were two things that I wanted to do. I wanted to, change the industry. I wanted to impact the industry in terms of the way we operate of our culture. And I wanted to start my own business and figure out how to do that. And then I wanted to give back to my home country. I wanted to find a way to give back to Wales. And so I had to find a way to make both of those things happen. And here we are, you know, five years on. It's five years. Last month, I walked away from my corporate job. Congratulations. And it's, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And it's, it's happening, but it, I, I mean, there were moments, Harry, where I just, I thought, oh God, you idiot, right? You've taken your salary to zero 
And of course, didn't expect a pandemic to hit me right between the eyes, right? That yeah. was huge slap in the face. I was on unemployment. So you go from C-suite salary with all the trappings that go along with that to being on unemployment within two years. <laughs> oh, I was I was tempted to go back to the corporate world. And some and some offers came along, good ones. And the ego, you talk about the ego when you get a, a mention with a podcast. The mm. ego was like, yeah, we could do look at this job. It's got a big title, it's got a big salary. But deep down inside, I knew it wasn't right. And I talked recently on my latest episode about 2X versus 10X thinking with the work of Benjamin Hardy. And 2X thinkers think about incremental improvement. So that would be the next job, right? Let's go for the next job. Let's go for a little bit more salary, a little bit more title, a little bit more responsibility. That's sort of incremental thinking, right? 10X thinking is, hey, how about we walk away from all of it, take our salary to zero for at least five years, and then hope that we can figure this out and that the money will come back. How about that? That's 10X thinking. And that's yeah. what I did. So, but what gives you the, I guess, what gives you the confidence, what gives you the, the self-esteem to be able to walk away from that job? I'm interested. I'll, just to, just, just to know it's just this, I mean, it's just a belief inside of me that I can change this industry. I can, I can impact it in some positive, meaningful way. I don't want people to be miserable in this industry. And there are a lot of people who are still living under command and control model, and they're miserable. And I am right in the heart of it. I live in the Metro Detroit area. I see it. I live, eat, and breathe it every single minute of the day. I don't want people to have to, to suffer in this industry. And I want this industry to survive. Let's not forget that. I interviewed John McElroy, who you know is a luminary in the automotive industry and has been for decades. And he said that we'll see more change in this industry in the next seven than we have in the past 100. Think about that. In the next seven. And Tesla is eating our lunch. And if we do not find a better way to operate, i.e. culture, then forget about the products. You can have the best EV lineup on the planet. If you can't figure out how to change, pivot, and be more agile the way Tesla is and change your culture, I know that not everything is good about the Tesla culture, I'll give you that. But if we can't figure out how to do that, then we're not going to be here. So I think that it's, it's alarming what's happening in the industry right now and what we need in terms of culture and leadership. I mean, you could almost say it would take an architect to create that, wouldn't you? An architect of cultural transformation. Well, brilliant, Harry, because that happens to be the new title I bestowed upon myself. <laughs> I know, that's why. I, uh, but it's, it's, uh, what makes what makes you qualified for that? Just for the people listening, I want I want to know what you think makes you qualified. Thirty six years in the industry. Uh, one year, uh, one, maybe two years of outside of the industry, because I think it's also important to get outside of it, because often we think that in auto, you know, if you have never worked in auto, then you don't know anything and you can't work in automotive. And that's not true. So I think that my experience in automotive and my ability to understand and absorb new ways of thinking and doing things, I'm constantly curious. I'm constantly interviewing people on my podcast who bring a different thought process to the table and a commitment, a bone deep commitment to make this happen. We all know, am, am I, me, little Welsh farmer's daughter going to change an entire industry? Realistically, of course not. But I'm setting my vision high enough out there that I will have an impact. What that impact will be, talk to me in 10 years and we'll look back and see, shall we? Well, it's yeah, I will definitely. And there is a, I guess that you mentioned, which which ticked with me. You mentioned Tesla, right? And the way you were talking about it is almost the way you see it outside of Detroit. Not you know, obviously you got Ford, GM, you know, the, the big titans of the industry. But are we not supposed to include Tesla in that, or are we seeing it as a, or the opposition? No, I mean I'm I'm in the heart of it, right, in the Detroit area, uh, but. Tesla is very much part of the automotive industry and they are leading the charge. And we tried, we poo-pooed them 
you know, we dismissed them in the early days. It was like, think about Blockbuster and Netflix, right? So yeah. it's the same kind of thing, right? We we looked at them like, oh, yeah, yeah, but they don't, they don't know. They don't know. They've never made a car before. They don't know. Well, there are benefits to not having made a car before because you're coming at it with a totally fresh eyes approach. They came at it with a view to technology and not the mechanics of the vehicle. They came at it in an entirely, entirely different way. But the legacy auto companies also have their benefits. They know how to scale. Tesla had a tremendous amount of trouble scaling production. Mm. We all know it. So there are good things about, I would say, an EV startup culture such as Tesla, and there are good things about traditional auto. The winning company for the future will know how to mix that together and create a magic to identify their own culture and not try to fit somebody else's mold. Yeah. So interestingly enough, your idea of culture isn't the same format then. You're not, you're not preaching this one, you know, one thing fix, fixes all. No, absolutely not. Each, every company has to figure out what their culture is. And then the leader has to figure out how to amplify that culture throughout their organization. And where does that, where does that start out of interest? It starts at the top. No mm. question. It starts with the CEO and his or her leadership team. What is the culture that they want? And so many leadership teams don't spend the time in doing that. They may have like a poster on the wall in a conference room that says, oh, these are our values. This is our culture. We're a collaborative and we foster innovation. I've seen that a million times. We foster innovation. Uh-huh, really? Okay. So that means if you foster innovation, that means it's okay to fail because innovation by definition is iterating, 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 constantly tinkering, iterating, iterating. So it's okay to fail then in this culture. And then you get in there and it's like, it's not okay to fail. You fail three times in a row and you're done. So don't tell me you're nurturing innovation when you're clearly not. Yeah. What needs to be done then for those big autos to, to learn and, and to see if, so if I'm the CEO of, I don't know, let's play that game, CEO of X company and you come to me and you go, you know, I've just listened to your VP of sales tell me the story and this needs to change. How am I open to that conversation? I will never make anybody change, right? Because you, you can't, they have to want it. I am not going to convince anybody mm. that, the, the rate of the transformation that's required and the rate of transformation that's required. They have to see it. So they have to see the need for, well, let's go back to the, why I picked this, this title of architect, mm. right? I am not going to build the building for you. I'm not going to build your new building for you, but I'm going to give you a blueprint and I'm going to be the architect to, to guide you, but you got to do it. You have to do it on your own. Otherwise, you, you know, you can't hire these companies that hire these big consulting firms to do what? To tell them what their culture should be? No, you need to do that. I'll help you figure it out, but you have to do that. And I'll bring in different opinions and perspectives and what other companies are doing, but you have to do it. And that's why I have a three-step roadmap. Step one, get the leadership team offsite, figure out what your culture is. Step two, amplify it. Scale it up to all your teams and the people in your organization, which we do with an online course. Three, really tell the stories about culture because it's the stories, the human to human connectivity that brings culture to life. And step three, we amplify their culture through an internal company podcast, which for me is a beautiful thing because it combines both my passions for culture and leadership with podcasting. And there you go. Three step roadmap done. If only it was that simple. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> if it was that simple, they wouldn't need me. Exactly. But, they, I mean, it sounds like they do, though, because, I mean, I've... And I can't sit here knowing that I'm saying that I've been in the industry for over 30 years. I don't know anything, to be honest with you. I start this podcast out of curiosity. Like, it's, I just love speaking to people in the industry because it's something that, you know, not I would say necessarily I want to get into, but I want to learn about. And it's, and it's nice to know that there is someone like you doing what you're doing because you care so much about it. Yeah, thank you. No, anytime, anytime. And I want to know then, Jan, for you, what does the future look like if you were to paint the perfect, not culture, but if you were to paint the perfect roadmap for you and Gravitas Detroit, Gravitas Detroit, sorry, 
for the next five to ten years, what would that look like? I want to have a major impact on tier ones primarily. I would love to impact OEMs, um, but that would be a bit difficult given my size. But I'm not opposed to it. Hmm. But I want to see a major impact in, and I want to see conversations, more conversations around culture. And if I can impact, you know, five to 10 of the top tier ones, imagine the ripple effect that would have in the auto industry, because all of these companies are global. Let's not forget that. And if you could have a more authentic lead leadership model in the top 10 tier one suppliers in the auto industry, I would look back on that and say, yeah, I'm calling that a success. So 10 years from now, Harry, uh, I want I want the top 10 yeah. to get uh, it. Would you say you're chasing the same success, the same drive and the same, I don't know, clout, if you want to use that word, as you were when you started uh, as a, leaving the farm? That is a really interesting and fascinating question. So when I left my corporate job, I thought, and I started my own business. I thought, oh, this would be great. I could do yoga in the morning. I could go for walks. I can have lunch with friends. I could do all the things that I couldn't do in the corporate world. Do you think any of that stuff actually happens? No. <laughs> <laughs> because one thing I've learned is that your value system is your value system. And your relationship with work and your drive doesn't change. Hmm. Whether you're in a corporate environment or not, it's who you are. It's who I am. So I've transferred it now into my business and being an entrepreneur is a whole new realm of, of, of passion and drive because it's, it's your business. If there's some bullshit stuff on my agenda, I just don't, I, I won't do it. I don't have to take the meeting. I don't have to take the client. I've said no to podcast guests. I've said no to clients. Because it's just not a good fit. You know, you couldn't do that in the corporate world. So that having that the ability to do that fuels me even more. Mm. And I have to I have to reprogram my brain. I have to knock out the corporate training. And believe it or not, that is a lot harder than you might think. And so do you ever catch yourself then going back to the old Jan? Yeah. Yeah, and what is I do. what is maybe the things you're doing to not to stop this stopping happening, but you know to to nurture that out. You stop. You just stop yourself and you go. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I give you. I give you an example. So this idea in the corporate world that you need to fill your schedule, right? Otherwise, you're not being a good leader. You're not being a good VP, whatever, because you get too much white space in your schedule because you need to be busy. You need to be meeting with people. You need to be doing stuff. And you need to be seen to be doing all of that. And I realized that actually having that white space in the day to be creative and to think, and yes, to take some downtime is far more beneficial and will make you more productive and efficient in the long run. And I've had to, I've had to catch myself and force myself to put that white space in the calendar, which, you know, I never would have thought of before. Yeah. So what is your what is your white space this week look like? My white space this week? Yeah. I've got about uh, a day and a half of creative time in there this week. Lovely. So that's a good week. That's a good week for me to yeah. have that much, which I'm I'm thrilled about. Yeah, and I think I was I was guilty when I first started the podcast and I and I said I I quit my job, you know, managing a restaurant and I went, Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to spend more time into this. I'm going to put my energy. And I did that exact same thing. I did, I guess I didn't know it was the thing they do in the corporate world, but I started filling my calendar up so much that I was like, you know, I don't want to, don't want to start the day because I know I've got so much ahead of me. It's almost that guilt tripping yourself into working. Well, working, if you'd like, you know, in, in, in yeah. inverted commas. Yeah, when you have to just stop yourself and say, wait a minute, what is the thinking that's going on right now? What's the narrative that I'm, that's going on in my head? What am I telling myself? You know, do I, do I need to be, do I need to be this busy? Uh, why, why, what's this guilt, where's this guilt trip coming from? Uh, I battle with that, with my corporate demons a lot. <laughs> but I'm getting better at it. I think we all are, aren't we? We're, we're, all, we're all still learning. We're all still figuring out what's going on. Yeah. Is, um, in, I mean, Jen, is there anything you think was important we haven't mentioned, we haven't touched on, we haven't talked about? No, 
know. I think we talked a lot about culture in the industry and the leadership model. And I would just say that people need to embrace their authentic leadership selves. And if they want to understand more about what that's, that is, I'll provide a link you can put in the show notes. They mm. can download the 21 traits of authentic leadership to help define it. And don't be afraid to be yourself. You know, Don't try to mask yourself, or I heard this term the other day, or edit yourself. I like that. I like that very much. Don't edit yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are five questions that we end the podcast on. Yeah, they yeah. are quick. They are sure. quick fire, and they're um the first one of those is what's your ultimate three car garage? You mean what? What cars would be in there? Yeah, what cars would be in your garage? Okay, well, one I already have. I bought myself a Boxster S for my fiftieth birthday. So that was a few years ago. Yeah. So I have my my dream. That was my dream sports car. So I have that. Then I would get an EV and would be the next one. And I'm thinking about the Polestar. I like the look of the Polestar. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. And then the third one would be, I would love to go back and get the very first sports car I ever had in Wales, which was a little MG Midget, a little blue one. That would would be interesting. That would be interesting. I don't know if they have the, well, they had the big bumpers in America, wouldn't they? They'd have the, uh, the big gray. Yeah, but you could see, you know, sometimes you get vintage cars, and mine would have been like late seventies, early eighties, mm-hmm. vintage, and uh, I would love to love to have that back. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, sounds like you will, you will get it back. So here's, here's to that one. Uh, Thank you. The, the next question is: Do you have one car to drive on any road or track? Where would you go, and what would you take? One car. I. I have a VW Taos, which is branded differently in Europe. It's not called a Taos. I forget what it's called in Europe, but it's the base level VW SUV. Uh, T Rock. Yeah, it would be over here. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And I bloody love it. I, it's a base level vehicle. It's not fancy. I do have the, the Highland trim package because I'm a bit of a snob like that. I do like all the, the, you know, the heated seats and all that stuff. But it's, it goes, it goes everywhere and it's compact i can put all my podcast stuff in there all my workshop stuff in the back i just love that little car mm. fantastic and the next question is jan if, if you could do anything money was no object what would you do and why oh what would i do if money was no object i would go back and buy my childhood farm that i grew up in in coity in south wales that would be number one and I would scale up my business and franchise the business because there's a reason why I called it Gravitas Detroit. I mean, yes, of course, it's Detroit. It's the heart of the auto industry. But I see a Gravitas London, a Gravitas LA. Yeah, that's yeah. what I would do. No, yeah, brilliant. And the next question is then, Jan, the advice you'd give to a young Jan or someone that wants to pursue something with their passion? Advice I'd give to 25-year-old me or 20-something-year-old me? Yeah. Knock off the fags, which is not going to translate well into the American market. That means stop stop smoking. Don't smoke. And don't worry so much about the little stuff and what people think of you. When you're younger, you tend to think that people are thinking about you much more than they actually are. Right, so just don't worry about it. Don't let all these things about what you said or didn't say ruminate in your head and take up so much of your life. Just be comfortable in your own skin. And I realize that that's easy to say when you're looking back on your life. It's much harder to do when you're in your 20s. But I would, yeah, stop smoking. I I don't smoke now, but I smoked for way too long. And be yourself, be comfortable with yourself and don't worry about what other people say. That's fine. I guess it's fantastic advice, isn't it? Because everyone, I guess everyone's fighting their battles, and it's easy to put your blinders on, but you know, take those off and just you know accept accept yourself first off. I guess. Yeah. yeah. And and the last question is is what do you love most about the auto industry? I love the fact that it is complicated. It is complicated. It's a mix of parts of people and processes all coming together and the magic in making all of that happen. 
And now when we use the term mobility, the idea that you can bring mobility to people that couldn't own a car or their lives were restricted because they didn't have a, a way uh, to to be mobile, to get from A to B. I mean, come on. Mm. Is there any other industry you want to be in that could do that, that could impact people's lives like that? I'm all in. Fantastic. Well, Jan, thank you for your time. It's, it's been a pleasure to get to, to get to know you. And for people that want to know where they can find you, where should they look? You can find me at gravitasdetroit.com.